This is a really important topic. I think we in the dairy industry are just starting to think about the consequences of epigenetics. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity to put my two cents in. Also, I'm from Illinois. So I've been in Florida 38 years, but I'm originally from Illinois. So it's great to get back to the Midwest. Uh, in the time I've been at Florida, I've spent a lot of time working with dairy producers in the state. And recently, I've spent a lot of time working with uh, Florida cattlemen. And you know, Florida cattlemen are very proud of two things, being cattlemen and being from Florida. And my chairman, John Arlington, he's from northern Indiana. He grew up not too far from Fort Wayne. And he spent a lot of his career in extension working with cattlemen. And they're always pointing out to John that he's a Yankee, that he's not really a Florida cattleman. And this is a true story. One day he was arguing with this cattleman, and he said, what do you know, John? You're a Yankee. And John says, well, you know, I might be a Yankee, but my two daughters were born in Florida, and they're Florida natives. And the cattleman said, John, if a cat gives birth in an oven, nobody calls the kittens biscuits. <laughs> So I think the one thing that we've learned from listening to Eric and Jimena and uh, Dr. Britt is that the environment of the pregnant female, like John's uh, wife, can have a long-term consequence on the phenotype of the offspring. And Jimena showed us some data saying there can be transgenerational effects of the environment of the pregnant female on the offspring. And if there's two points that I want to get across today, it's first that nutrition plays an impact or has an impact on this epigenetic reprogramming of the fetus. It probably does that in a lot of ways, but one of the ways it does it is because the source of methyl groups for DNA methylation, this kind of central event in epigenetics, comes from the diet. And it's been shown several times that increasing the amount of methyl groups available in the diet can shift the pattern of DNA methylation in cells. So I think as we move forward, nutrition is going to be recognized as playing an important role in epigenetics. And the second message I want to get across is that this epigenetic programming of the offspring starts at the very earliest stages of embryonic development. In fact, it actually occurs in the gametes. So the environment of the bull, the environment of the cow before insemination can affect the oocyte and the sperm in a way that changes the characteristics of the offspring. And that's certainly true during the earliest stages of development, which is what I study. And the reason for that is that epigenetics plays an essential role in controlling how the embryo develops into a fetus and then into a calf. So this is a a photomicrograph of a bovine blastocyst, a day seven embryo. This is the first time the embryo is beginning to differentiate. Some of the cells, the cells in green, are going to become placenta. These are the trophectoderm cells. And then you can see there's a small cluster of cells that are orange. Those are the cells of the inner cell mass that are going to become the fetus. So, I mean, why are some cells green, some cells orange? Because they've been labeled with an antibody that recognizes DNA methylation. So the green cells, the cells that are going to become the placenta, they already have a lot of DNA methylation. They're starting to get programmed to be placenta. But the orange cells, they don't label with the antibody to DNA methylation. There's a little bit of DNA methylation there, but for the most part, those cells still haven't decided, are we going to become muscle cells? Are we going to become skin cells? 
So there's very little DNA methylation. So if we change the environment of the embryo during early pregnancy, we can potentially change how this DNA methylation gets laid down during the course of development and affect the phenotype of the offspring. So I, I have three take home messages. The first is changing DNA methylation during the earliest stages of life. So like in the cow, from day zero to seven, when the embryo's going from a one cell embryo to a blastocyst stage embryo, can change the program of development in a way that affects the postnatal phenotype of the embryo. And then the second point I'm gonna make is providing methyl donors in the diet is one way to change DNA methylation in the developing embryo or the developing fetus. And the last one is there's the opportunity to improve growth, reproduction, lactation, health of livestock by altering DNA methylation at critical times in development. We don't completely know how to do that by any means, but I think the opportunity exists. And what I want to do at the end of this talk is give you one example of this idea that we can change postnatal phenotype through the diet in the pre-implantation period. So I'll show you results of an experiment in which embryos were cultured uh, with choline and then transferred to recipient females and the uh, growth of the resultant calf were, were examined. So I think of, I mean, DNA method, epigenetics super complex. Um, but I just think about it in a very simple way. This is just a representative picture of a gene showing the target gene being regulated by a promoter. The promoter is the part of the gene that acts like is the light switch, turns the gene on or off. So when a transcription factor, little TF on it, binds to that promoter, the gene gets turned on. Right? So sometimes the gene is turned on, sometimes the gene is turned off. What DNA methylation does is make that promoter inaccessible to the transcription factor. So that even if the transcription factor is activated, it can't really access the target gene. And so rather than the cell being able to turn on a specific gene, that gene's silenced. And this is reversible, right? It's not necessarily always silenced or always on. So the environment of the cell can affect whether or not an individual gene is methylated and turned off, or demethylated and turned on. I mean, that's a lot of what goes on just in day-to-day -day regulation of all our uh, cellular functions. But sometimes DNA methylation occurs for long periods of time. So like your skin cells, all the genes involved in lactation are probably shut off permanently by DNA methylation. And what makes DNA methylation so important from a inheritance perspective is that these changes in DNA methylation can be inherited from one cell to a daughter cell. So when a cell divides, the daughter cells can replicate the same DNA methylation pattern as the parent cell. And it can even occur going from the mother to the embryo. So a DNA methylation pattern in the mother can get recapitulated in the offspring. And that's an example of inheritance, but not through changes in DNA. So that's why it's called epigenetics. <clears throat> 
its inheritance, but an inherited change in gene function, but without a change in the gene sequence. And so, as you change the environment of the cell, provide more choline in the diet, expose the fetus to heat stress, you can change the pattern of DNA methylation. So, I mean, this is just another simple example of showing, like, one of the functions of DNA methylation. So, I'm just looking here at two genes, myoglobin, very important gene in the muscle. It binds oxygen to provide oxygen to the muscle cells because skeletal muscle contraction requires a lot of ATP production. You need oxygen for that. So muscle cells produce the myoglobin gene. And then the other gene I'm showing here is beta casein, the main protein in milk, which is synthesized by mammary epithelial cells. So in the muscle cell, the promoter for myoglobin is open, and the gene is turned on. And once the gene is turned on, it produces a messenger RNA for myoglobin, which then directs the cell to produce the myoglobin protein that binds oxygen. But the beta casein gene is shut off in the muscle. The muscle cell does not want to produce beta casein. So probably that promoter is methylated. So the transcription factors would ordinarily turn it on, can't do so. It's more complicated than that, but I think that's a pretty good representation of what happens. So in the mammary gland, you know, the opposite occurs. The myoglobin gene is shut off because of DNA methylation, but the beta casein gene is open so the transcription factors can bind, turn the gene on, and eventually the protein gets synthesized. <coughs> so the first take-home message I want to make is that changing DNA methylation during the earliest stages of life can affect the postnatal phenotype. Right? The environment of the mother is important for the phenotype of the offspring, even when the embryo is just a few cells. So let's look at this a little bit further. This stage of life for the embryo is probably so susceptible to epigenetic reprogramming because the embryo is undergoing a lot of epigenetic programming. You know, think about it. When an embryo is formed, it's formed from a sperm cell, which has the sperm epigenome, and, a, and an oocyte, which has the oocyte epigenome. But now the embryo, it doesn't want to be a sperm cell. It doesn't want to be an oocyte. So the first thing that happens during early stages of development is that all of those DNA methylation marks are removed from the embryo. So if you look at the two-cell embryo to the four-cell embryo, this is another photograph of labeling for DNA methylation. You can see that there's a lot less DNA methylation in the four-cell embryo than the two-cell embryo. And the same is true at the six to eight-cell stage. That one real bright cell there is actually a sperm cell. But then, new DNA methylation marks get put on because now the embryo is going through development. Some of the cells are going to become placenta. Some of the cells are going to be the fetus. And those cells need the right DNA methylation to let them function like the kind of cells they're supposed to be. So if we change the pattern of DNA methylation in these earliest stages, we can have long-term consequences for uh, the offspring after it's born. One of the first guys to show this was a guy named Tom Fleming at uh, University of Southampton in England. 
Now, he did a lot of studies looking at the effects of protein nutrition in the mouse, the rat, the rabbit, just during the earliest periods of embryonic development. So in this study, he took female mice, minis, mated them with Mickey Mouse, male mouse, and then from the day of mating until day three, the now pregnant females were fed either a normal diet for a laboratory mouse in terms of protein availability, so that's an 18% casein diet, or he had another group of female mice that were fed a low protein diet, 9% casein. And that dietary treatment was just for three days, from the one cell stage to the blastocyst stage. After that, both groups received the 18% casein diet. And then after parturition, the offspring were raised. And here's some of the results from this one study. A lot of times when you're studying epigenetic regulation in the pre-implantation period, there's a sex effect. Males are programmed differently than females. We don't really understand that, but it occurs a lot of times. And that's what they found. So if you look at the top graph, oh, here we go, uh, you can see that it, comparing the normal protein diet group to the low protein diet group, really no effect on body weight. But in the female offspring, those that were in females that were fed a low protein diet, just for the first three days of life, had heavier body weights at 21 days of age. That's about the time of puberty in a mouse, as compared to those fed a normal protein diet. You see the same thing when you're looking at the ratio of heart weight to body weight. And there's also a blood pressure effect that occurs in both the males and the females, more for the females than the males. So just changing the environment, the protein nutrition of these pregnant mice for three days changed the characteristics of their offspring. You know, I do a lot of work with uh, in vitro production of embryos. So when we culture cow embryos for transfer into recipients, we're culturing, we're culturing them for seven days in a very unusual environment, right? Instead of living in the oviduct and the uterus of the cow, they're living in a plastic dish. And they're in a medium that is much different than the fluid that they would exist in in the oviduct and the uterus. Probably all the things listed in that slide differ between embryos produced in vivo and embryos produced in vitro. So in some ways it's really surprising that in vitro production really works at all. Right? Probably about 3% of human babies this year born by in vitro fertilization. They're also exposed to this very unusual condition. And in most cases, I mean, development's fairly normal. The pregnancy rate's lower than for an embryo produced in vivo, but still, lots of embryos establish pregnancy. But as Jack mentioned in his talk, there are some indications that the phenotype of those embryos is different. And occasionally, it's like horrendously different. So this is a calf born by in vitro fertilization. That's Rocio Rivera now at the University of Minnesota. That calf weighed twice the normal birth weight for a calf at birth, so 200 pounds. And it never stood up. It lasted about two weeks and died. You know, probably about 1% of the calves born by in vitro fertilization have this large offspring phenotype. Something happened to the epigenome of that embryo that 
screwed up or dysregulated the pattern of muscle growth, skeletal growth, later in fetal development. And you get these large offspring calves that almost always die. Big problem, actually. Here's another example of a large offspring calf. Those two fetuses are at 86 days of gestation. The top one has kind of a normal fetal weight for that stage of gestation. The bottom one weighed twice what the one on top weighed. And probably, had this pregnancy allowed to go to term, that calf or that fetus would have become a large offspring calf. So just changing the environment of the embryo during those seven days, in a dramatic way, uh, changed the way that the embryo grew. So that sounds pretty depressing. <laughs> but keep in mind, you know, a lot of the epigenetic literature comes from human subjects or from people interested in human health, and they usually focus on the negative effects of developmental programming. How, how your postnatal phenotype can be screwed up if something bad happens to your mother. But not all of the developmental programming is necessarily negative. So if, as, if, as we understand more about the process, I think there's an opportunity to uh, regulate DNA methylation in a way that enhances uh, production. So the second take home message I wanna explore is this idea that providing methyl donors is one way to change DNA methylation. That's not necessarily obvious. You know, this is such an important event, whether or not a gene gets turned on or turned off, you wouldn't think that how much methyl groups are floating around would affect DNA methylation. That it'd be much more tightly regulated than that. But in fact, it seems like that's not true. If you provide more methyl donors, you get more DNA methylation. So now in the cattle industry, we have the ability to provide methyl donors to cattle in a way that we never had before because we have rumen-protected choline, rumen-protected methionine, two methyl donors. Ordinarily, those would be oxidized in the rumen by the bacteria, but now we can get them across the rumen and change the availability of methyl donors uh, in, in the animal. These two mice are genetically identical. They were both raised, or they were both gestated in mothers that were fed the reproductive toxin BPA. And that screws up fetal growth. But the brown mouse was gestated in a mother that was fed a diet really high in methyl donors, whereas the tan mouse was gestated in a mother that did not receive all those methyl groups. And these mice inherited the agouti gene. The agouti gene is what gives that tan-colored mouse that pretty hair coat. But the agouti gene is regulated by DNA methylation. So when the brown mouse was in a mother that was receiving lots of methyl donors, its agouti gene got methylated during fetal life, and so it was brown instead of tan. And also having all those methyl groups blocked the effects of bisphenol A on abnormal fetal growth that the tan mouse was experiencing. So these, these mothers were really slugged with uh, methyl donors. They received choline, folic acid, betaine, and vitamin B12. So, you know, we keep talking about DNA methylation, DNA methylation. What we're talking about is taking a methyl group from S-adenosylmethionine, 
uh, derivative of methionine, and transferring that methyl group, transferring that methyl group to cytosine to produce 5 prime methyl cytosine. That's what we're talking about. So in these mice, this shows the one carbon metabolism cycle. Here's S-adenosylmethionine, the precursor for 5-methylcytosine. So these mice were being fed methionine, betaine, um, choline, and vitamin B. So given lots of methyl groups in the diet and providing all those methyl groups was able to convert a fetus from this to this. So, you know, can we do that in cattle? That's what I'd like to know. So we've started to explore that question using the in vitro produced embryo. And now we're doing more studies uh, using embryos produced by artificial insemination. But the only data I have right now is for the embryo produced in vitro. So let me tell you about that. So we tested whether or not treating embryos with choline in culture would change the properties of the resultant calf after embryo transfer. So in other words, during this period of development, from the one cell stage to the blastocyst stage, does providing methyl donors in the form of choline program development of this blastocyst so that the resultant calf experiences a different postnatal phenotype? Now, choline is quite an impressive molecule. I mean, it's got three methyl groups, so it's a very good source of methyl groups for DNA methylation. And when it gets oxidized, it, it gets converted in two steps to betaine, which then donates a methyl group to homocysteine to form methionine, and that methionine is a methyl donor for s methionine the molecule that allows DNA methylation to take place. But choline can also undergo two other biochemical reactions, right? It can get acetylated, like Eric mentioned, to form the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, or it can get phosphorylated to uh, eventually produce phosphatidylcholine, change lipid metabolism. So when you give choline, you're changing DNA methylation, but you're doing other things as well. So Elia Bastrana, who is, uh, was a PhD student with me at University of Florida, he's now back in his native Mexico working with the Ministry of Agriculture. He tested whether adding choline to cultured embryos would change the uh, phenotype of the calves, and that's one of his calves right there. So, he did a whole series of experiments. Actually, we never planned on spending as much time on this as we did, but uh, we, he ended up doing this for five years. So the first thing we did was evaluate different concentrations of choline for its effects on uh, in vitro characteristics of the embryo. I won't spend much time on those experiments, but what I just showed you was another picture of DNA methylation in blastocysts. And when we quantified that DNA methylation, you can see that 1.3 millimolar choline and to a lesser extent, 1.8 millimolar choline increased the amount of DNA methylation in the blastocyst. You know, 1.3 millimolar choline, that's a high concentration of choline. Most choline in the blood is present as phosphatidylcholine. If you sum up all the choline metabolites in the blood of an early postpartum cow, it's about 1.3 millimolar. But free choline, choline chloride, is only about 4 micromolar. So, I mean, we're adding a lot of choline here. The other thing Eliab noticed 
was an increase in lipid accumulation. So here are embryos stained for lipid in the cells. You can see there's more green, more lipid in the 1.3 millimolar group and the 1.8 millimolar group than in the other two groups. And that's shown here uh, quantified. So choline does at least two things to the in vitro produced embryo. It increases triglyceride accumulation and it increases DNA methylation. So next, Eliab tested whether or not embryos cultured in 1.8 millimolar choline would have an altered phenotype as compared to control embryos cultured without choline. So we did this experiment with Brahmin embryos, Bos indicus embryos. So produced from Bos indicus females and sired by, by Brahmin bulls. So then those embryos were cultured either without any choline or with choline. They were then transferred into Angus or Brangus recipients and the calves then followed uh, through weaning. So there's one of the calves born from this project. Uh, a Brahmin calf with a uh, surrogate uh, Brangus recipient uh, female. So here's some results on the pregnancy outcomes. You know, we actually didn't transfer that many recipients and you need a lot of animals to see a difference in pregnancy rate. And we didn't see a difference. 54% of the controls were pregnant, and 44% of the recipients receiving a choline-treated embryo were pregnant. And then when we look at calving rate, because some of these embryos are lost before calving, 43% for the controls, 39% for the choline. Gestation length, if you notice, was a little bit longer for the calves that were produced in culture with choline. Brahmins have very long gestation lengths and it's highly variable. And it was longer for the choline treated calves than for the control calves. So here's a bunch of data on the postnatal phenotype of the calves. And we looked at this data by sex so we had female calves and male calves, but there were no interactions uh, between choline treatment and sex. So birth weight was significantly higher for the choline treated calves than for the vehicle treated calves. This was true in both the heifers and in the bull calves. So some of that difference was because gestation length was longer. So if we adjust the data for differences in gestation length, there's still a difference in birth weight, but you can see it's, it's about, say, five kilograms in the males and about um, four kilograms in the females. So still there, but at least some of the difference in birth weight was because of the longer gestation lengths. However, this difference in body weight persisted until weaning. So the weaning weights for the uh, choline-treated females was about 13 kilograms, 26 pounds heavier in the choline group, and about 37 kilograms, right? 70 some pounds difference in the males. So something that happened to those embryos when they were at most 150 cells had a consequence for the weaning weight 13 months later. So that's epigenetic reprogramming. When we looked at the DNA methylation in the muscle of the calves, it was altered by the choline treatment during the culture period. So we looked at 8,000 methylation sites, 
8% of those in the muscle were differentially methylated. And when we looked at the genes that are associated with those DNA methylation, differentially methylated sites, those were genes that were involved in cellular growth and muscle function, like the mTOR signaling pathway was regulated. So changing the, changing the environment of the embryo in terms of providing more choline changed the birth weight of the calves and changed the weaning weights um, at seven months of age. So, you know, how practical is what I just showed you? There's not many embryos produced by in vitro fertilization. The number are increasing. But I think it establishes the idea that we can change the environment of the pre-implantation embryo, the very early embryo, and affect the phenotype of the calves in a beneficial way. And I can tell you, Florida producers, they don't want calves of larger birth weight, uh, but they do want calves of larger weaning weight. So, you know, I just remember when I was an uh, undergrad at the University of Illinois, I think the very first course I took was Animal Science 101. And the very first module we got, this is back in 1974, was genetics. And I never forgot this equation, that the phenotype of an animal how much milk it produces, how much it grows, how healthy it is, depends upon its genetics and its environment, right? Everybody knows that. And, you know, as an animal scientist, I'm very proud of the work all of us uh, in academia and in industry have done to change the parameters of this equation so that we've made tremendous progress in producing a more efficient animal and a more sustainable system for producing milk, for producing meat, than, I was, a, than, than was the case when I was an undergrad back in 1974. We are really good at genetic selection. We know how to identify genetically superior individuals and propagate them. And we have learned a lot about how to raise animals, how to change the environment of a calf or change the environment of a cow so as to optimize its expression of the genes it inherited to maximize or optimize milk yield growth rate, etc. I mean, there is the change in genetic merit for milk yield from 1960 to 2020. I mean, that is tremendous progress. The genetic merit for milk yield has doubled in that time. What I would suggest is all of our emphasis on changing the environment of livestock has been after they're born. And like I say, we've made tremendous progress in optimizing that environment. But we haven't yet really thought, we're just starting to. I mean, some of the data that, Reluc uh, that uh, Jimena showed you today is an example of that. We're starting to think about how the environment of the embryo, the environment of the fetus, can affect the postnatal performance of the animal once it's born. And so I think that's where epigenetics is going to play an important role in letting us further enhance uh, production by optimizing the environment of the offspring before it's born. So I'll just end with a couple of photographs. I want to thank all the people who did all the work that I talked about today, especially uh, with this uh, project with the Brahmin embryos. Jeremy Block from University of Wyoming was critical with that. Here's the farm crew in the lower corner.
Balchem supported some of that research. The Florida Cattlemen's Association, even though I'm a Yankee, supported some of that. NIH, Conaseed. And I will tell you that we're still working on this. So I have a new graduate student, Lainey Heyman. She's continuing to do studies uh, with embryo transfer to see if we can repeat the effects of 1.8 millimolar choline. And we're also looking at more physiological effects of choline chloride. So we're treating embryos with 4 micromolar choline, 0.004 millimolar choline. So those studies are just being done. We have some birth weight data from another experiment with 1.8 millimolar choline, and we saw the same effect. And then Masrur Sagir, who's uh, in the red here, is starting to look at what is the effects of feeding rumen-protected choline from one day before breeding until seven days after breeding on characteristics of beef calves. And we'd like to do the same thing uh, in dairy cattle. So I'll leave it there. Thank you.